Hi, this is Clark on Temptress, and today I'm going to continue my series about how to build uh, a wind generator for your boat or land or wherever. Uh, today we're going to concentrate on the alternator itself. This is the alternator for my wind generator. You can see it's pretty simple structure here. It uh, spins around, it spins on uh, like automotive trailer bearings. It uh, has two sections that carry magnets and make a rotating field. The magnetic field travels through this blue plate and the blue plate has coils of copper wire in it. When the field goes across the copper wire, it induces power, comes out as three phase. I do some magic below and that charges our batteries and runs our life. These things are really great. When you design one of these, the biggest trick really to get it right the first time and have it really be efficient is deciding how many turns of wire I put in these coils and how big do I make the coils? Do I make it out of thin wire with lots of turns or really coarse wire with a few turns? If you get that right, you get a very efficient wind generator. If you don't get it right, um, if you make it too small, not enough turns, the alternator can't pull the torque off the blade and the extra power just becomes drag and it's just a waste. If you overdo it, if you put too many turns uh, of wire in your coils, it takes too much torque off and then the blade spins slowly, like, like there's a brake on it all the time, and it, again, doesn't make much power. So there's a sweet spot. Finding that sweet spot often means guessing and then you make another stator, then you make another stator. It's just not a way to do it. I've worked out a way to do it with math and procedure and I'm offering it to you and I'm going to walk you through it bit by bit. In this video, I want to talk to you about the design phase of building a wind generator. This is very important and it's what you need to do before you can carve a blade or cast a stator. This video is mostly for people interested in building their own wind generators or at least their own alternator, whether it's for wind or hydroelectric or some other low speed alternative power source. For you wind generator types, I'll be producing a couple more videos soon. I'm trying to address things I don't see being talked about on YouTube. Upcoming will be a video on installing and balancing the blade and one on an Arduino based regulator I'm building with an ideal diode rectifier stage. So let's get started. In this video, I hope to describe how you can design your own wind generator. Specifically, how to choose the blade size and pitch and how to figure out what size wires to use and how many turns is right for your project. I'm going to show you an approach that will make all the engineering decisions that you need without having to guess. First, you need to decide what you want out of your wind generator. Before you actually start winding your stator coils or carving your blade, it's important to have a good handle on what it is you want your finished product to do. You can design a wind generator that produces loads of power in high winds or one that sacrifices high wind amperage for low wind performance. In order to determine what's right for you, let's start by answering these questions. How much wind does my site regularly have? What size restrictions do I have? How much power do I want from my finished project? I know at this point these questions seem difficult to answer, but let's start with a guess. Go through the design process and you'll learn a lot about what's possible. This may help you dial in on what you really want. For example, you might initially want to build a wind generator with a 4-foot diameter rotor. After you run through my spreadsheet, you find you just can't produce the power you want on your property, not enough to make this project worth doing. So you step up your design to an 8-foot blade and find now there's plenty of power available. How much wind does my site regularly have? You should have an idea about how much wind you have to work with. You might live where there is only 10 to 15 knots of wind some of the time, or you might have strong, reliable winds available to you on a regular basis. If you don't know this off the top of your head, it's just a case of observing the wind over a period of time or finding a record of someone who's already done the work for you. For much of the world, there are charts that show the average wind speed. You can probably get a pretty good idea by just Googling average wind speed and the name of your city. My own wind generator is used on a boat that travels, so I have to have a device that will produce power in places like Florida and the Bahamas that have relatively low winds. I also travel south to where the trades winds are strong, 
But when I can, I find a quiet harbor to protect me from the 20 to 25 knot average winds. So my wind generator still needs to produce power in low wind conditions. Remember that if you are building on land, higher winds can usually be found by going up. So if you include a tower in your plan, you might have more wind available than you think. If your property has a ridge, you might find a place with a natural wind amplifier you can also take advantage of. What size restrictions do I have? In simple terms, a big blade makes more power than a small blade. A small increase in size can make a big difference in the amount of power that's available since a larger blade inscribes a larger circle with a much larger area. The equation comes down to the serradius, so doubling the size of the blade gives you a fourfold increase in available power. In my case, I found that the largest blade I had practical room to spin and the ability to store was 8 feet. How much power do I want for my finished product? You should have an idea about how much power you want from your finished wind generator. After all, it's probably not worth doing this work if you're only going to make a few amps from the project. On the other hand, you can always build a bigger unit, but at some point it's just a waste if it makes more power than you need. Decide how much power you need to make the project worth doing. Let's get down to it. Start by opening up my spreadsheet and going to the Generator Design tab. The green cells on the left are the input fields. The current values are what I entered for the wind generator that's on my boat. I think it's a good starting point since you can all watch my video and see that these numbers can be turned into a unit that you can actually see running on Temptress. It's okay to just leave my numbers in the fields to start with. I'll go into details about each field as you need to modify it. The blade efficiency is set to 20%. This means that one expects the blade and the bearings to eat up or not take advantage of about 80% of the energy that's in the wind. This is a reasonable number to use. If you think your airfoil is extra special, you might want to try a higher number. Or if your blade is wonky, it could be a little less efficient. But in my experience with this style of blade design, 20% is about right. Next, type in the diameter of the blade you want to use. Then take a look at the blue columns. These show how much energy is available at various wind speed. Does this look reasonable? If not, you might have to try a different diameter. At this stage of the game, the only thing that affects the power available at any given wind speed is the size of the blade and its efficiency. Notice the power curve isn't a straight line on the graph. This is because the energy available in the wind is a function of the cube of the wind speed. So as the wind blows stronger, the energy available from it is much higher. If the wind speed doubles, the energy available increases by eightfold. Let's take some time to try a few numbers now. When you feel you have a reasonable guess on the diameter, we will start working on the other side of the process, the alternator. The blade turns wind speed into torque. The alternator eats up that torque and turns it into electricity. It does this by spinning magnets over a group of coils of wire. The spinning magnets induce current into the wire. This current creates a magnet field of its own that fights the moving magnet and takes torque out of the blade. If you make your magnetic fields too strong or you use too many coils of wire, you take more torque out of the blade than the wind can put back in and you get a stall condition. If you don't take enough out, you just waste the power that's available in the blade. Notice that the power curves for the alternator stators are straight on this graph. Without loads of fancy electronics, it's impossible to build an alternator that perfectly matches the power curve of the blade. The idea is to design to the conditions you expect at your site. Now we're going to fine tune the design until we get a graph that shows the most efficiency at the wind speed we expect to see. Looking at the red line, you can see that I set up my wind generator to produce good power in very light winds. I could have made changes that would have allowed me to produce much more power in 30 knots, but that would have been at the expense of my low wind performance, and I'd already made the decision. That's what's important to me. I want to comment on wind generators you can buy. One company might say their unit produces 30 amps. Another might say theirs produces 35. These are maximum numbers, and they're measured at some very high wind speed. But the customer says 35 is more than 30 and buys the larger unit. Likely, the first unit produces more power in reasonable winds. So for any wind generator, it's important to look at the whole power output curve and make decisions based on the wind that you expect your unit to actually be used in. 
So let's start playing with the numbers for your alternator. The first thing to do is to know how much magnetic flux your rotor can put into the stator. I looked into the math to do this and found it was just too much for me and it involved a lot of unknowns. So I decided doing this part with equations just wasn't practical. I had no way of knowing how powerful my field was going to be without actually mounting the magnets I was going to use on the rotor that I was going to use, since the magnetic flux travels through the rotor's discs. Once I had this all together, I discovered that I could either buy a field meter, which were very expensive when I first built this unit, or just do a simple experiment to get the real number. I decided to use the experiment for this step. The first value in the green column is a result of that experiment. You'll have to do that yourself, and you'll have to enter your own value. The short of this number is how many volts are induced at one turn of wire and at one RPM of spin. It's a very low number, so let's talk about how to get it accurately. To do this, you need to build your rotor, and for that, you need to decide on your magnets. As a rule, the greater field you can produce, the better. Maximize your magnet. It's the best investment you can make. When I made my first generator, strong magnets were very expensive. Now even stronger ones are available much cheaper. There's virtually no downside to making a stronger field, but adding more coils of wire brings up resistance in the wire and lowers the current. If I was building a unit today, I would experiment with setting my magnets into a Hallback array. I haven't seen anyone use a Hallback array in a wind generator yet, but I've had great luck with it in other applications. Once you get your rotor built, put it on a table and set the space between your magnets for the width of your stator and a little bit more for clearance. You might want to play with this number. If you design for a thin stator, you'll have a higher magnetic flux because the magnets are closer together, but you won't have much room for a lot of turns of wire. If you design for a thicker stator, you'll have loads of room for wire turns, but your magnetic flux goes down. You should do this experiment for several different magnet gaps. That way you can decide later how many turns of wire you're going to use in your stator. Now make up a coil of wire with 10 to 20 turns. It doesn't matter what size the wire is, any wire will do. Rig it up in a jig to hold this one coil between the rotors and hook it up to an AC meter. Spin the rotor at a precise speed, say 100 RPM. Now it is just a case of measuring the voltage and dividing it by the number of turns and RPMs. This is your volts per RPM per turn number for the spreadsheet and represents the magnetics of our alternator. Now you get to start playing with the coils. My spreadsheet is for an alternator that puts out three phase AC power. Each of my phases is split into four coils, so I have 12 coils in total. If you have fewer coils per phase, you will need to change the equation in cell C13 from four to whatever you use. Now you need to go back to the input fields and come up with the right stator design for your needs. Type in the volts per RPM per turn field you measured. You already know about the blade efficiency and the diameter numbers. The TSR stands for tip speed ratio, and it is a measure of the pitch of the blade. I talk about this in my carving a blade video. In short, this is the ratio between the speed of the wind and the speed of the tip of the blade as it spins around. It defines the RPM of the blade at any given wind speed. I wouldn't go higher than seven, Six is a very popular number. As this number goes lower, your RPMs go lower, and you'll find it harder to build an alternator that can pull the available torque off the blade. The next field is battery voltage. This is the nominal voltage for your charging system. Choose a number that your batteries will be at when accepting a charge from the wind generator. As you lower this number, you will see that the wind generator will put out more current. This is because it has to overcome the voltage in the batteries before it can push current. It's interesting to see that when your batteries are discharged, your wind generator puts out a lot more power than when they're highly charged. Now we are down to the important numbers, the numbers that will actually allow you to build your stator. At this stage, we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You will be making a coil of wire with some number of turns. The more turns, the longer the wire needs to be. And for any given gauge of wire, a longer wire will have a higher resistance. We'll need to know that resistance. Start with an estimate based on how long the wire is. Find a table on the internet for your gauge of wire. This number is what I found for 240 turns of 15 gauge magnet wire. Now just play with the number of turns until you get a curve that you like. 
Then go back and re-estimate the resistance. Before you actually build your stator, you will probably want to mock up Hoyle and measure its resistance. Then go back to this spreadsheet and fine tune the number of turns. Now let's talk about what we want our power curves to look like. In short, you want the alternator power curve to just touch the blade power curve just at the point where the wind blows most of the time. You can then read up and down the alternator power curve and find out how much you can expect your wind generator to produce in every wind condition. Keep changing numbers until you get something that works. Once you are happy with the result, it's time to cast your stator. What you don't want is for your alternator to try to take significantly more torque off the blade than the wind can put in. If this happens, like in this area, the spreadsheet will show bold in the amps column. For these wind speeds, you will never get more than is available in the blue column. You'll be slowing the RPM of the blade until the physics works. If you go too far over this number, you'll get in a true stall condition where no amount of wind can make the blade turn any faster. This is essentially what happens when my regulator notices an overspeed condition and trips its relay that shorts the three phases. My alternator tries to take too much torque off the blade and very quickly slows down to such a slow speed that the blade is in a true stall condition and can't generate power. This protects my wind generator from storms. I'm sure you notice that there are two columns for generating an alternator power curve. One in orange is labeled delta, and one in red is labeled star. These represent the two common ways to wire up a three-phase coil set. Delta gives you more amps, but at a lower voltage, and star gives you more voltage, but at lower amps. If you want to know more about the difference between these two, I recommend you Google it. Either could be right for your application, and it's even possible to have all the wires come out of the stator to allow you to throw a switch that makes your wind generator better in light winds or heavy winds. So once you've worked through this worksheet, you want to check out the second tab here. That sheet will give you what you need to know to actually carve a blade. I go into that in more detail in another video. This is a complicated process and it can be confusing, but trust me, it was more confusing without this tool. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate uh, you sitting through this video. If you're here, I bet you're interested in alternators. If you want to build one or you have some questions about them or they just seem cool, uh, mention it down below. I'd like to help people in this kind of a project. If uh, you think you might want to build a wind generator, I can offer some other ideas. I can do a video on a regulator I've designed that uses ideal diodes in the rectifier stage and can watch the RPM with an Arduino and shut the, alter, the wind generator down if we get too much wind. Uh, I want to do a video maybe on just mounting and balancing it and you know, making sure it's ready to go safely. And I've already got a video on uh, how to build a blade from scratch. And there's another video out there in our collection already just kind of shows ours in action. Anyway, I hope you find this interesting and I'll see you in other videos. Bye from Temptress.